It's going to be in chapter, in chapter 2, verse 18. And uh, we continue in our short series on submission. Uh, we started um, last week, basically, with uh, <clears throat> the first topic in, in, in this uh, uh, short series. And that had to do with uh, submissive citizens. That's what we talked about last week. And uh, please understand, when, when we talk about submission, there's no way we can get all that there is about biblical submission in just one or two, uh, couple of studies here. But I, I, try, I am trying my best to give you just the main, and principle, um, the main principles of this uh, uh, topic in submission. And then, um, by all means, let's pray. It, it needs a lot of prayer. I mean, you really need to... Uh, approach these topics here with a lot of prayer and uh, to really go with what the Bible says. Uh, it's my intention just to put things in, in a biblical way out there and then pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to teach us and guide us and lead us into these um, subjects. Because like Pastor Steve said, it's not an easy thing, but yeah, it is biblical. So we shouldn't be afraid of it. We shouldn't just skip over it and, and just say like, oh, well, we'll go to another book because it's easier. No, it's in the Bible. We go through it. And then uh, it's, it's what it is. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we, oh, we thank you so much for um, teaching us these things, Lord, that quite honestly, we will not take on these topics voluntarily just because we don't like nobody to tell us that we are to submit to nobody. But when we understand that submission is a, it's a, it's, it's a matter of our relationship with you, and we understand that there is no form of authority in this world in this life that is not from you. So when, when, when we understand that, we have a, a clear perspective and a better understanding of these things. So Father, teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So submission, and why submission? Well, because when you have, you know, the, the, the wide open eye of uh, scrutiny over you, which is going to be the case in the next few years, when you have the wide open eye of scrutiny over you by the world around you, there are some things that in the Bible that we need to remember so that we can understand this uh, subject of submission and we can go about it from a biblical perspective. I must remind you, though, in your Bibles, in chapter 2, in verse 12, verse 12 is the one verse that really makes uh, the other subjects here. This is the hinge. Everything has to go with and has to go back to this one verse. If you, if you can read that verse there with me. It says in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, having your conduct honorable. That's the whole point. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. Now remember, later on he's going to say, here's the deal for us Christians. We are here temporarily. We're sojourners. We are pilgrims. But in the meantime, the Lord says, I am placing you next to, nearby, and among the Gentiles that they see your honorable conduct. It's all about God. And when we remember these things, and, we, and when we keep everything from this perspective, then we go like, okay, so the Lord is telling us, I have placed, placed you where you, whatever you are right now, whatever I am right now, I have placed you, the Lord says, there, so that your conduct, honorable conduct, can speak volumes to people around you about who God is. And that's the whole point here. So, so then from that perspective, if my conduct is to be honorable, I am going to be an excellent citizen. And I am not going to have an issue submitting to authority because I understand the principle be behind submission to any form of human authority. What is the principle? That there's no authority other than what God has given us. That every form of authority in this world, any form of authority comes from God himself. Because ultimately, behind any human authority, there is God himself. And when we understand those things, it's like, so submitting to authorities is actually submitting to God. Yep, if we get that principle, we don't have a problem submitting to authorities. Do we submit in all things? Absolutely not. What are the things that we're not to submit? Those things that go against the word of God. When authorities, or for that matter, whatever circle of authority, whether at home or school or work, or government, anybody in that circle of authority that tells us that to go against what God has telling us or teaching us, taught us in, in his word, we don't do that. Because then we much rather obey God than obey what? Men. And so we understand that. There is a place when we say, no, 
it's non-negotiable, and we are not going to go there because God says. And so now we see in order for us to be excellent citizens, we understand this concept of authority. God wants us to have an honorable conduct among the Gentiles that they will glorify his name. Okay, I get that. What about at the workplace? And that's what we're going to take here in verse 18. And notice the first word in verse 18. He says, servants. And that's what we're going to talk about. Last week, submissive citizens. Today, submissive servants. Next week, submissive wives. And I know you're not going to be happy with that, but no, just kidding. But then, hey, then submissive husbands after that. So be okay. We start with this verse, 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable. The word commendable there is grace. This is grace. If because a conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is, again, the word commendable. This is grace before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his footsteps. Oh, no, actually, he followed his steps. So what is the topic? Submissive servants. Let me ask you before we get into it. How many of you can honestly say, oh, I love my job? I do. I love my job. <laughs> if I was to ask you, how many of you don't know? I'm not going to go there. But the, the thing is this. What Peter is doing, he's writing about this, which is a very painful subject. But he's writing about this because next to home, Work is where you're going to spend most of your time. Next to, and some people actually spend more time at work than they do at home. And so you can see that this is a very important subject here. This is a very important thing. So he says this. He's going to set the, the background for this. He says, look, if you are to live honorable among the Gentiles, you better understand this concept of being submissive servants. And, and, and then he's going to get into some of the details. Because we spend so much time at work, the workplace becomes for us a stage, an open door of opportunity for the grace of God before unbelievers. For eight hours, you're going to have the opportunity. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what you do when you go to work. You're there to turn on the light and then do what you do. Do excellent at what you do. So that they can see you and they say, wow, this man is really cool. He's good. This lady, I mean, she is a hardworking lady. Because understand this, please. You, as individuals, you can make such a, I mean, more powerful impact than, than, than a preacher, than an evangelist, than a pastor. Because you get to spend eight hours with people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. They get to see you. They get to hear you. And then they get to study you. And they are like this. Whether you, 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 you pay attention to that or not, they're like this. And unfortunately, sometimes they, they pay more attention to the little things we do wrong than the many things we do right. But if we learn these principles here, and I, and I think that these are awesome principles. If we learn these principles and they become a, a part of the fabric of who you are, and the fabric of our work ethics, they're going to change your life. They're going to change the way you approach uh, employment, and they can definitely change your work environment. It is important. It is important that you remember this. Let's, let's, let, let's check some of these principles here, and, and we understand this. Now, the first word here in verse 18, servants. Servants in the Roman Empire made up perhaps half of the population. It is estimated that in those days when these things were written, the, the, the population of slaves in Rome was close to 50 million people. Half of the Roman Empire was made up of slaves. And when we talk about slaves here, it says here servants. But there are a couple of words for servants in the New Testament. One is doulos. One who says, I want to be a servant. I don't want to go nowhere. I want to stay here with my master because he treats me good. He respects me. I want to stay here. That will be one word for servant. But there's another word for servant, and that's what this word is. It's a household slave. 
It's that person that gets to do the, the nasty, the difficult, the dirty things at home. And in those days, there were many of them. Remember, the Romans will go conquer another country, make all the inhabitants of that country slaves. They will bring them to Rome, and then they will put them on display, and they will say, this particular slave here, he is a doctor. Who needs a doctor at home? Oh, I need a doctor. Well, he will take this man to be uh, their slave so he can, they can have a doctor. And they had all kinds of occupations in that. It's not that they're slaves because they don't have education. No, it's all kinds of people there. Some, of, some former military personnel, they will be slaves and they will be serving for these people. And so when you see the word slaves here or servants here, it's a very interesting word because the word for master here, when he says, be submissive to your masters, the word in Greek is despotis. It's a despot. It's a person who has unlimited and absolute authority over another person. So this makes the conditions really difficult, really painful. And it is to these people that Peter is writing these things. They had no rights, very little protection. The master had the authority for, uh, to take the life of any of these. If they didn't like the way they cook, they can execute them right on the spot. That's how cruel, that's how, uh, I mean, evil the conditions in those days. A Roman citizen looked at, at a slave from this perspective, and I quote, the only thing that distinguished a slave from a beast is that a slave can talk. That's how they look at people in those days. And here's what I want to say. And it is interesting, it should be interesting to us, that nowhere in the New Testament you will find one verse that speaks about slaves rebelling against the masters. Not one mention of that. And I can see several reasons for that. Christianity didn't want to become a rebellious movement so they can be crushed by the Roman uh, um, uh, government anyway. But I can see another reason. The gospel will come. And what is the central message of the gospel? If you can think of one word that is the central message of the gospel, what would that word be? So the redemption. And what is redemption? What is Actually, redemption. What does the actual word redemption mean? Setting people free. And so here's the point. The central message of the gospel is redemption, and it is about setting people free. It is interesting, though, that these things are written uh, somewhere around 60 AD or, or that. By the year 425, it is estimated that the slave population within the Roman Empire has decreased dramatically. Why? One only logical explanation, the power of the gospel to set people free. So the gospel comes and deals with the matters of the heart. Because injustice, whatever it is, it's a matter of sin. And sin is an issue of the heart. And so the gospel, rather than speaking against slavery and all that, later on, even in our nation, there will be movements. There will be people who will promote you know, set the slaves, the slaves free. And that was great. It was the timing. God had a timing for everything. But the gospel in those days never incited any form of rebellion against slavery. But what they did is they preached Jesus, for that was the only way for people to be free. And so when he says here, servants, be submissive. Notice what he says here. Be submissive. Uh, the word submissive goes against our nature. Because submissive is actually kind of like meaning, do you mean that I have to put myself under the authority or so-and-so? Yeah, that's what it is. And, and, and it's, it's, it goes against our nature. You don't have to uh, go deep and study this. Just observe little children. Don't touch that. Don't touch it. Don't put that in your mouth. It's, it's, a form of, it's a natural form of rebellion. And so, and so you see that, and then when you tell the little kids, submit to mom and dad, ha, 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 immediately. It's, it's a natural thing, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's in us, it's in our nature, in, in rebellious nature. But, but Christians here are uh, exhorted, the, 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 the teaching for them, and it's a very practical command. This is Peter says, submit. Be submissive to your masters. Now, when it says here, be submissive to your masters, those that have control, absolute control and authority over you. And it says here, with all fear. The word fear is actually the word respect. 
Be submissive to your masters with all respect. How can you respect somebody who treats you like that? Who sees you like a property, like a piece of nothing? And yet that's exactly what the Bible is doing here. You know, and we're going to see some, of, some principles here. I'll give them to you and you can just write them down because I believe with all my heart that some of these principles, that they come out of the Bible anyway, some of these principles can really revolutionize the way I see employment and employer relationship. We're going to see here, be submissive to your master with all fear. Notice this, not only to the good and gentle, we understand that, but also to the harsh. Harsh is unreasonable. Be respectful to your masters, even to those who are unreasonable. The word is actually twisted. That's the word for uh, harsh, twisted, crooked. Be respectful to them. Why, why is that? Well, we anticipate complications here, for sure. We start reading these things and we're like, it doesn't make sense. Why? Because I'm working for somebody that you don't know, Bert. You don't know my mom. No, I don't. And quite honestly, perhaps I don't want to know him or her. But I do know who gives us these principles, and that's the whole point here. If I'm going to be respectful to those who are twisted and unreasonable, there's got to be something in me that gives me something that I don't have. What is it? It has to give me some perspective that I don't understand. Principle number one, you ready? Whatever you do, work hard and work in an excellent manner. How can I work excellently for somebody who is twisted and crooked? I'll tell you why. Be the kind of worker that any employer will want to have. Be the kind of worker, be the kind of employee that any employer will want to have. Why? Because there is respect, there is, <laughs> there is something in you that makes you different. You are not like the world. There is something in you that gives you the, the ability to do this. Notice what it says. This is commandable. What is commandable? That is grace. What is this word grace here, actually? The word grace here is God's given ability and capacity to be this type of person. Oh, this is heavy stuff. I, I, I kind of like don't like it. No, I don't. So God says, be the person that do excellent things and work hard in doing excellent things because God says, I have given you the ability and the capacity by my grace to do that. Principle number one, work hard and do your best. Trust God with the rest. So it is important that you remember this. Because you're going to get into some things about work here. Obviously, these things are written for slaves. We're not slaves in any way. Well, technically we're not. But in a sense, we are. You know, uh, our employer pays for those eight hours, and we are there, so we are there, and we're going to do whatever they say. But, but that's another topic. Be submissive to them, he says. Why? Well, here's principle number two. The workplace... Whatever you do here, whatever you're doing at your employment, at the place of employment, notice that to you is to be a mission field. That is a mission field. You're not working for that company. You're not working for that employer. You're not working for that boss. You're there because that is a mission field. And that is important for us to remember. Again, when the wide open eye of scrutiny is over you, you must behave in a way that is honorable. And it is honorable to go to work with this perspective, this biblical perspective that makes you think, I work at this so-and-so company, but I believe 100% the Lord put me there. If you can honestly believe that, if you can honestly act in that manner, workplace for you is going to be different. Work for you is something that you will enjoy. Work for you is going to be something that is so uh, uh, an opportunity for you to glorify God. Think about if you've been working for this company for 15 years, and I ask you, how is it going? Eh, same thing all the time. But what if you change that attitude and said, I've been doing this mission. I'm serving as a missionary at this one place for 15 years. Something is about to happen. True? If for 15 years God has been reaching out to people around you in the workplace, something is about to happen. What is that going to do? It's going to elevate your position and it's going to change your attitude. If you make the workplace a, a mission field, it's going to 
is going to, number one, elevate your position. I'm not working for the paycheck. I'm not working for this person or this company. I'm working for the Lord Jesus himself, the king of heaven and earth. And it's going to change my attitude. I'm here to see some miracles. I'm, I believe that there, I'm going to get to see some miracles. October 12, 1492, Christopher Columbus gets to this one island called Bahamas. And right there, there's another little island. He gets to that island first. He calls that little island San Salvador, meaning Holy Savior. And when he gets there, he writes this in his prayer journal. I know uh, Christopher Columbus is not something that we really want to imitate and <laughs> by all means, but, but here's, here's what he wrote in his prayer journal on that day that he arrived at that place. He said this, O Lord Almighty, by thy holy word, thou hast created the heaven and the earth and the sea. Blessed and glorified be thy name and praised be thy majesty, which has designed to use us Thy humble servants, check this out, that thy holy name might be proclaimed in this second part of the earth. You has designed, he says, thou has designed to use us, thy humble servants, that thy holy name might be proclaimed in this second part of the earth. You know what the name Christopher means? What? It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Christ bearer. He, he was someone who brings Christ with him wherever he goes. So he takes on his name. He says, yeah, I bring Christ wherever I go. And he gets to this island and he says, God, you placed us here that we might proclaim thy holy name to this part of the earth. Obviously, he had other hidden reasons and other, other things. But we have more than right to use this kind of attitude and approach, don't we? Wherever we go. What if I just go to the workplace tomorrow morning and I said, in the name of Jesus, I'm walking into this company, proclaiming this company for Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven and earth. What if I had that attitude when I go to school? What if I change the attitude of my children when I send them to school? Son, daughter, you're going to go to that one school and you're there to, want to do this one thing. You are there to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. But, but grandpa, if I preach Jesus, they're going to kick me out. Live your life in such an honorable way that they will see your good deeds and they will glorify the name of your Father in heaven. Does that make sense, church? Does that make sense? You see how the subject of submission, which is ah, painful, I don't want to talk about it. No, 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 hey, listen. Give it, this give it this approach and you will see how things are different. I go to the workplace, number one, principle number one. I do my best. Whatever I do, I do excellently. I want them to say, this is the best employee I ever had. Not because of my abilities, but because of my position and because of my attitude. That's within you. I mean, seriously, can anybody do better than Jesus? And that's what you do. You bring Jesus. And so this is, and you might be thinking, come on, Bert, be real, please, okay? We work with real people, nasty people, I mean, grumpy people, and envious people. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Still the same Jesus. This will elevate your position, and it will change your attitude. As believers, we ought to have an attitude of gratitude. Somebody said, gratitude is the altitude that sets the... Gratitude is the attitude that sets the altitude for living and working. Gratitude is the attitude that sets the altitude for living and for working. I work for my king who is in heaven and rules heaven and earth. That's what I do. And it is a very commendable thing that you do this. And, and, and so, back to Peter, when we read these things here, this is commendable, verse 19. If because of conscience, meaning if you are conscious of God's presence with you. That's the thing. Are you fully aware that God is with you wherever you go? Just because he doesn't say anything doesn't mean he's not there. Just because he keeps silence doesn't mean he's not there. Just because you don't hear him doesn't mean he's not seeing what you do. Or knows what you're thinking. Or sees where you're going. Or sees your attitude. Or sees your behavior. 
or sometimes bears the embarrassment. I've had people before in you know, different places that, yeah, man, I, I got in a fight with my boss. And, uh, this is, and well, I'm praying that God will forgive me. <laughs> Seriously? And that's why the Bible puts these things here. We're not to cut corners. We're not to take advantage of people. We're not to be there for six hours and get paid for eight. We're not to go on a lunch break for an hour and a half just because we have the freedom. We're not to abuse company time. We're not to steal anything from them. We're not to do any of those things. We're there to be people of honorable conduct because when they see our good works, they glorify our Father in heaven. And because I'm going to do my best, I'm going to be an excellent employee because guess what? The workplace is my mission field. And I want him to be glorified. And so that's what it says here. Now, if you want to see a couple of examples of people who actually believed this and went out and did this, read Daniel chapter 6. And read uh, the book of Genesis chapter 39 and chapter 50 with, the, with, with both of those men, Daniel and Joseph. I mean, what an amazing testimony of grace and all of that. Under the most severe circumstances, there they are, minding their own business and glorifying God. And, and, and they both have this, this, this one thing that happens to both of them different times. But to them, the most powerful men in each one of these nations, whether it's Pharaoh that comes to Joseph and says, Joseph, what do we do now? Can you imagine Joseph like, uh-huh, uh-huh, now you need me, huh? No. He says, this is what we're going to do. And at the end of that, he reveals the secret. He says, because God sent me here for a purpose. And Daniel. He gets to be thrown in the den of lions, and, and the king is at night not able to sleep because Daniel is suffering. And he goes and says, Daniel, Daniel, is your God able to deliver you? And Daniel comes out of that and says, yep, my God is faithful. And then he says, praise the Lord, of, I mean, the God of Daniel. Blessed be the God of Daniel. Why? Because they understood these things as if they are in the Bible. And, and it is really, see, the whole point is this. This subject of submission deals with the inward purity of my heart that is manifested in the outward quality of my life. The inward purity of my life is going to be manifested in the outward quality of my life. And you don't have to say anything. That's undeniable. Nobody can say anything against that. Because let me ask you, why do you work anyway? Because I have to? <laughs> no. Because it pays the bills? No. Put food on my table and uh, I want my pension, my retirement? And, uh, no. What do you work for? What is the number one reason why Christians work? Here's the, 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 the number one and probably perhaps the best of all. I work to please God. Because it is my God's, my, my Father's pleasure to bless me with everything that I need. He already said that. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And then what is he going to do? It's up to him. So I work because he pleases God. My, employ, my, my place of employment is my mission field. It happens so that he makes these people pay me for the time that I'm there to preach him. So I am blessed. People sometimes ask me before when I was in full-time ministry, so uh, are you in full-time ministry? Of course I am in full-time ministry, but you work for somebody. What is the difference? It doesn't matter. Full-time ministry, you guys are in full-time ministry. You never stand behind the pulpit, but that doesn't mean you're not in full-time ministry. That's full-time ministry because you're working for the king of kings. Amen? So back to Peter. This is commendable. Because you are fully aware and conscious of God's presence with you, it doesn't matter what happens. It says, well, it says right here, if you get punished for doing what is wrong, why are you surprised that you are being punished? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Now, that's not to say that they still pay you $5 an hour and the minimum is 15 and you're still there. No, 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 no. You ought to be practical. You ought to, you ought to do things that are reasonable. Hey, listen, uh, they changed minimum wage 10 years ago. I still make $5. What's going to happen here? Are you going to do something? 
There's nothing wrong with saying, okay, if not, thank you very much. I got to go. I got to move on because I have to, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not, that doesn't mean that you're not being submissive, that you're practical and you're real. But at the same time, don't never, let me, let me tell you this uh, slowly. Don't ever quit a workplace just because you don't like it. Don't. Because who put you there to begin with? If you have this perspective, who put you there? The Lord did. And you don't want to quit on him. He's got something that he's teaching you. Principle number three. Not only you do your best, you do excellently, but you make the workplace a mission field. Principle number three. Take Jesus to work with you. If you want your workplace to be different, take Jesus to work with you. He will be delighted to go with you every day. I mean, imagine what, it, what is that going to do to your, to, to your perspective on work. If you want your workplace to be transformed, take Jesus with you and let people see how excited you are about Jesus and how real you are about Jesus. There's this, 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 sometimes this confusing idea that the, 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 there is the sacred and then there is the secular. The secular is this and the sacred is this. There's no such a thing for us Christians. For us Christians, everything is to be sacred. Everything is about the Lord, amen? Is there a place when we said, okay, Lord, I'll see you later. I'll be, you know, at work and... No. We do everything with that perspective. Whatever I do, Paul says, even when you're eating, you do that for the glory of God. And so, you, you know that I'm good at it. So, <laughs> I've changed the philosophy of ministry in Panama. I said, three things are going to be important here at this church. Faith, family, and food. Messed up people, man. But what I mean is this, seriously. Do what you do for the glory of God. Notice what it says. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Are you there? I know you're there already. Again, as a quick parenthesis, I thank God you have no idea. You think that I'm just saying crazy things? I don't. I'm not saying crazy things. Listen. I thank God so much for the opportunity to learn the Bible together with you people. It has been the most amazing experience of my lifetime. It has been the most amazing thing that ever happened. To learn the Bible together with you guys, it, it, it sure blesses me and Lily, and we are so thankful for that, and we love you, and we thank God so much for you guys. Ephesians chapter 6. It says here, bond servants. See, this is the other word. He says, the, those that are servants by choice to Jesus Christ. He says, but servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. With fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ. Not with eye service as, mean, as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. Doing the will of God from the heart. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. See this? Don't be a man pleaser. Be a Jesus pleaser. Do everything for his honor and for his glory. Be the kind of worker whose eye is not on the clock, but is on the Lord. Lord, this is such a great time here that it doesn't matter. You know, I'm, I'm having such a great time. Before you have your cup of coffee, you're already having a conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ. Before you jump in your car, uh, uh, earlier I said, and you see Jesus there on the passenger side, no, no, let him drive. He's really good. You be the passenger. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to enjoy my time with you here. And I just want to spend time with you. And you're having this attitude. You're not going to be bitter. You're not going to be like me. You're not going to be like, ah. You're going to have a great time at work. And you're probably saying, like, this is kind of like a fantasy bird. No, it's reality. It's reality. This is, this is what God is teaching us here. Leave that workplace at the end of the day saying, I am so blessed. I got to see Jesus do these things. And he gave me the strength to do my, my, my job. And I, and I did in such an excellent, excellent manner. Before I go to sleep, thank you, Lord. I can't wait to get up tomorrow morning and let's do this again. Because the, the workplace is your mission field. Have you heard the name Antonio Stradivari? Have you heard the name uh, Antonio? He's the one that made the most amazing violins ever in history. Some of those violins, uh, I, I heard that one of them was sold for 
10 million dollars. One of those violins. He lived in the, in the late 1600s, early 1700s, and he had this, this one thing about making violins. He was a wonderful woodworker, and he was just a great guy, but he loved Jesus. He was a great guy. And, and, and he started making uh, all kinds of instruments, but, but he came to this point, he says, I'm gonna start making violins. And he got his employees and all of that, and he says, listen, it is totally not acceptable just to do things because. We have to do excellent. These are going to be the most excellent violins ever. And some of the employees are like, seriously, it's just a violin, man. Come on, $20, whatever. no, 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 no. This is what he said, listen. God needs violins to send his music into the world. If any violins are defective, God's music is going to be spoiled. What do you think that happened to those employees? How, how much did he elevate those employees? Dude, you're making an instrument that is going to bring God's music to the world. You better don't mess around. Now you see why those instruments became such a precious instrument. And sometimes, church, this is what I ask myself. What kind of melody does the world hear coming out of me? Do you believe that God's hands are upon you all the time? Is God touching you as an instrument to produce this sweet, sweet melody? There are sometimes some music that I definitely don't like at all. I will not listen to that kind of music. And sometimes I think my life sounds just like that type of music. When I, I'm, not, I'm not allowing God to produce this sweet, sweet melody, even though he's got his hand of protection upon me. If God puts so much in, into an instrument, remember, he created us to his image. If Christopher Columbus says, I am Christ bearer to the world, whatever I go, we can say, no, no, it's Jesus in me, whatever I go. Whether it's the workplace, whether it's school, whether, whether it's whatever. That you can have that attitude and we can have that attitude. And just like Christopher Columbus, he says, this is the territory. And they go, ah, oh, they're going to know my God here. You do that same thing. And, and that's exactly what Peter is telling us here. Check it out. In Peter, he says, this is commendable before God. Verse 21. You there? For to these you were what? Yep. This is a calling. This is not something that we want to do. You, see, if you look at it, this is not somebody hire somebody to do this kind of work. This is a calling upon my life. I was called upon, my, this is calling upon my life to be a missionary. Where? No, in my workplace to begin with. The, the best place to, to teach about missions is the workplace. Any good employee, any excellent employee will make an excellent missionary. I have seen, being a missionary, and I don't want to be disrespectful to anybody, for the thousands and thousands of men and women who are sent out to the mission field, and the many of them, the great number of them that fail and, and make a disaster out of the mission field, and they just do all kinds of crazy things, I believe that philosophy needs to be reversed. If you want to be a missionary, show me that you can be a good, faithful, excellent employee for somebody or else I'm not sending you. How can you be under, in, in a country under nobody's accountability, under nobody's authority, and you cannot have the same attitude in, in the workplace to begin with? And, and that's exactly what Peter is telling us here. It's a personal calling upon my life. What is the good news? That this is a calling from the Lord himself. We're following a suffering savior. We're serving the king of kings. We're serving the Lord of lords. He has the plan. I always say this for the mission field. He has the plan. He has the purpose, and he has the people. The place is nothing. The plan, the purpose, and the people, the place will come. And once you get there, he has the power to keep you. And it works, that, it works like that all the time. So principle number four, don't just show up to work, grow up. What do you mean grow up? Yeah. Don't be there just like, okay, I work there, can't wait, I have 
one year, three months, 15 days, 14 hours before retirement. I can't wait. No. Show up to work, but grow up. Grow up. What I, what, what I mean by growing up, the, listen, please listen to this carefully. The job isn't just to satisfy you or to supplement you. The job is to shape you. Let me say that again. The job is not just to satisfy you or to supplement you. It is to shape you. Do you believe that suffering can actually be beneficial? I don't like it. Do you believe that suffering can be beneficial? Yep. Why? A couple of reasons. Suffering keeps me pure. Because as I'm suffering, guess who am I spending time with? Jesus. So suffering actually keeps me pure. Number two, suffering keeps me humble. So what about you, Mr. I can do it all in my own strength. I don't need nobody. No, really. Please forgive me, Lord. It keeps me pure. It keeps me humble. Number three, suffering keeps me dependent. Lord, if it's not you, I can't do nothing. When I was first asked to go to be on staff at Calvary Chapo Costa Mesa, I was working as a mechanic. And my workplace sent me out to auto mechanic school. And in those days, they were coming out with this brand new vehicle called the Viper, Dodge Viper, beautiful car. And I remember my, 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 uh, my, my boss said, hey, uh, we thought about a couple of guys. We came up with your name. We want to send you to school to be a Viper Tech. Ooh, my pride went up to, man, the moon and back. You mean I'm going to be a Viper Tech? I was already a Christian. Sure, I want to be a Viper Tech. So they sent me to school. They paid for everything and all of that. They gave me a big old thing that says, Mr. So-and-so, all of a sudden, he's a Viper Tech and blah, blah, blah. And I was the only one that could teach those vehicles in my dealership. Nobody else could work on those cars but me. So I, foolish that I was, I went and bought my big old toolbox, spent thousands and thousands of dollars on that. Because, I mean, come on, that thing right there saying that I was a Viper Tech didn't look good with the Craftsman toolbox on the bottom. I had to spend a lot of money on that thing. Two weeks after that, Brian Broderson comes to me and he says, we actually want to ask you to consider coming on staff here with us. Immediately I said, nope. It's okay. I just thought, I'll, I'll ask you again sometime. Don't even bother, Barry. I'm here. I help. No work here. No bueno. <laughs> Two weeks after that, I get in the car to do something. It was raining. I'm getting in it, and I slip, and I basically broke my knee. Had surgery immediately and, and all of that. For rehab, they gave me like six or seven weeks. Guess what I was doing during those six, seven weeks? Volunteering at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. Something that they want to pay me for, I did as a volunteer. I go back to work, because I'm a Viper Tech, go back to work. <laughs> so it's like, man, nobody mess with this. I go back to work two days only. Another accident. This time, it wasn't even my fault. I'm in a car with somebody helping my friend find some kind of noise, and a car comes from behind. Four more weeks of rehab. It was not even, not even an injury. So I go back to Calvary Chapel. Brian, again, you want to be on the stuff? You, no. <laughs> Driving home, pick up Lily. I said, Lily, can you believe this guy? He keeps asking me, what's his problem? My son is sitting in the back. He used to go to high school there. And he says, Dad, so much for always talking about living by faith. I said, who asked your opinion anyway, man? It's easy to talk when you don't have to pay bills, man. Go back to work. And I said, listen, I thank you so much, but I have to resign. Dude, we spent all this money. We did. I know. But this time Jesus is for sure telling me I had to go there. I said, Brian, I'm here. Do you, now, understand, please, from a Viper Tech, to staff coverage up across the mesa. <laughs> Chuck never believed in paying anybody anyway. <laughs> so comes Thanksgiving. I'm saying this 
because it, it makes sense. You will see how it makes sense. So comes Thanksgiving. Now I'm probably six months into working in staff at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. Comes Thanksgiving. And for the first time in many, many, many years, we didn't have nothing to eat. And Lily said, man, people invite us for Thanksgiving all over every year. We don't want to go because we have our own thing. Nobody's inviting us this time. And there I am. I said, Lily, that's fine. I have you. You have me. We're good. It's about 6, uh, close to 6, 5.30 or so. And I get a phone call. And this sister from church says, where have you been? We've been looking for you, call you so many times. You're not answering. I was always here. I have nowhere to go. I don't even have gasoline to go nowhere. I've been here. Well, you better come. Hurry up. I got something for you. We never told anybody that we were struggling, as, as I'm telling you. I go to the front office of Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, and there's a basket, and another basket, and another basket, and another basket, and another basket. I didn't even want to touch this stuff. And as they I learned, if you're not dependable, if you don't know what it is to be dependable on the Lord and his provision for you, you have got not, no idea what employment is. And so we got that, and I said, Lily, you're not going to believe. We're going to have a great Thanksgiving dinner, man. It's just, just pick your choice here, ham, turkey, whatever. And, and what I get out of that, my son, after he says, Dad, here's something I am going to never forget. The moment you're willing to give up what you think is yours, the moment you start receiving what you know is his. And it was my son. And I kind of like, I don't like this kid sometimes. But <laughs> Listen, make it, make it the aim of your life. Follow these principles, the biblical principles. Listen to what the Lord is saying. He says, I'm calling you to this. How am I going to do it? The Lord, I'm just saying this. The Lord says, that's not your business. That's my business. If I call you, I will sustain you. If I call you, I will protect you. And if I call you, he says, I am going to change even the attitude of your heart, that you will actually enjoy the workplace. But even if there is abuse, and even if there's mistreatment, and even if they don't recognize, they don't, they don't pay me, the Lord says, you don't work for them. How can they pay you? He says, do you want to live with what? Whatever comes from man's hand, or you want to live by heavenly provision that is endless. So when the Lord says, submit, he says, submit. And then in between, he says, I will provide. Submit, I will protect. Submit, I will be glorified. Submit, I will be your reward. And then I said, blessed be your name. Though submission is a hard word for me to digest and to even think about it, I, am one, I want to make sure that I follow him. I'm just going to give you a few verses, and with those, we're going to close. We're coming back. When Peter puts these things in writing, the people that are reading and, and, and listening to the reading of these things the first time, they definitely had this, this question for him. I know they had this question. Okay, Peter, it's easy for you to be, say, submit as slaves. You have never been a slave in your life. And Peter probably says, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I'm, putting, I'm not putting myself as the example of this. You ought to be following the example of Jesus. Notice what it says in verse 21. We're coming back to these verses, but I just want to give you a, a, a little bit of information what's coming next. It says, for, these to you, for, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. We're going to elaborate on the word example here. So what does that mean? It means this. The one who says that he abides in Jesus, and Jesus abides in him, out himself walk in the same manner as he walked. Number two. Yes, the Bible says this. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Number three, Philippians chapter 1 verse 29 says, For you, to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And the question that immediately strikes in my heart is this. With all of that being said, are you willing to follow him? Yeah. Remember, 
If you're going to follow his footprints, that's what the word says here. If you're going to follow in his steps, his, <laughs> his ministry led him to be rejected by the religious leaders of, in, in Israel. Number two, his ministry, his life, and, and it, what he was doing led him to be arrested by the Roman soldiers and beat up and abused physically by them. Number three, his ministry and his life <laughs> put him on the cross. It's the love, of God, the love of God we know. Now, he's not telling us to go to the cross and to die for nobody's sin, not even for ours. But in between, what was his attitude? Isaiah 53, together with 1 Peter chapter, chapter 2, verse 22 to 25, is going to tell us. When there was accusation, what did he do? When there was abuse, what did he do? When he was mistreated, what did he do? When he could have defended himself, what did he say? You see, what Peter's going to do is going to take the supreme example of Jesus Christ and he's going to elevate that and he's going to say, whenever you question why do you have to submit, why do you have to obey, why do you have to work, why do you have to be excellent, why do you have to do, don't look there, look up here. Look at those hands that were pierced for your sin and my sin. And when I look, whenever I look over there, I just quickly look up there and I'm right there, right at the foot of the cross. And I have to say, forgive me. Forgive me. But you got to teach me how to do this. And actually, don't just teach me, but you have to do this. Since you are in me, you abide in me, you have to do this, Jesus. And the Lord Jesus is going to say, oh, I would love to. But you're willing to follow me. And that's the question for you and that's the question for me. Are we willing to follow him? Amen? Amen. Make sense? So, you, so, so we do this and we turn an ugly subject of submission to other people into an amazing opportunity. Where it's, oh, man, can't wait for tomorrow. I actually, I want to go to work right now. Forget lunch. I just want to go. <laughs> Amen? Because that's how Jesus can change your attitude. Fathers, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you and we thank you so much. Lord, how amazing, how beautiful. We don't have to come up with no man's philosophy, understanding, and wisdom, and words, and all these crazy things that we can do. It's in this book we call the Bible. It is this Bible, the supreme authority for everything in life, for everything that pertains to truth, and for everything that has to do with faith. Everything is in this book we call the Bible. And this is the supreme authority for us Christians anyway. This is what your word says. And it is our honor. We delight in, in being people who have been given the ability and the capacity by your grace to serve you at the workplace. Oh, that doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. It doesn't have to be. Because, Lord, one thing we know. The deeper the pain, the brighter the glory. <sighs> the deeper the pain, the brighter the glory. It is your glory, Lord, that moves us. And it's the glory of your name that motivates us to go and to love you and to serve you. No turning back. No turning back. It's all about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.